A transcript of this podcast episode is available in the show notes of the Buzzsprout podcast site, or if you are listening on another podcast player, you can go to storiesfrompalestine.info and read along in the related blog post for this episode. You are listening to Stories from Palestine podcast, a podcast that is recorded in Palestine and about Palestine. My name is Crystal. I am a Dutch woman who is married to a Palestinian, and I live with my husband and two children in Beit Safafa between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. I study the tour guide program at the Bethlehem Bible College, and I produce a weekly podcast about the history and cultural heritage of Palestine. If you want to get a weekly email reminder when a new episode is online, if you want to follow the podcast for photos and extra content on social media, or if you want to do a much appreciated donation on the Kofi platform, then click on the link in the show notes of this podcast. Last week's episode was all about the month of Ramadan, and we are almost halfway the month now. My personal Ramadan experience is going well. I am sticking with my personal challenge and I have not had any alcohol, barely any sugar and just little carbs. I'm listening to my body and nourishing it with lots of vegetables, fruits, proteins, dried nuts, seeds. I try to eat healthy snacks and I am still managing to do a daily meditation and some workout. I'm much more mindful now and much more conscious about every moment of the day. And as I agreed with my teacher of Islam, I am working on an episode about the history of Islam and the important aspects of the religion. And I will do that to replace for a final exam that was hard to prepare for in Arabic. But for this week's episode, I went to Aida refugee camp in Bethlehem And I did an interview with Rua at the Noor Rehabilitation Center. And in this episode, you can learn more about life in a Palestinian refugee camp and about the challenges that people with disabilities face. Rua talks about the Noor Women Empowerment Group and how they established a school for children with disabilities. And I hope with all my heart that after hearing this episode, some of you will be inspired to make a donation or to organize a money collection or find funding or other ways to support this beautiful project in Ida Camp. But before we visit the organization, let's go through some important information regarding the refugee camps. Because Ida Refugee Camp is one of three refugee camps in Bethlehem, and one of 19 official refugee camps in the West Bank. There are also another four unofficial camps that are not served by the United Nations. And then there are eight refugee camps in Gaza. There are 12 Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon, and nine in Syria, 10 in Jordan. And then there are another six unofficial camps, not registered by the United Nations. So that makes a total of 58 official refugee camps and another 10 unofficial camps, 68 refugee camps. The number of Palestinians that are registered with the United Nations as refugees is about 6 million. One and a half million of them live in refugee camps run by the UNRWA. This is the United Nations Relief and Work Agency. This was established especially for the purpose of human support and relief for the Palestinians, those who were displaced in 1948 by the Zionist militias. In 1948, more than 500 Palestinian villages and cities were attacked by the Zionist forces. They were trying to depopulate the whole territory that would become the state of Israel. And the Palestinian towns were attacked from three sides. They would leave one side open to the closest border so that the Palestinians would flee over the borders towards Lebanon, Syria, Jordan and Egypt. 
And all these refugees hoped that they would be back after all the violence would end. But they were never allowed to return. And so today we're talking about the third and even the fourth generation of refugees living in the camps under pretty harsh conditions. Aida refugee camp is only 0.07 square kilometers. When the camp was set up in 1948, there were 94 tents and there were 1,125 refugees. So from 1,125, it grew to about 6,000 inhabitants now. The majority of them, about 60%, are under the age of 15. There's one school for the boys and one for the girls. They are run by the United Nations. In Aida refugee camp, the unemployment rate is about 70%. And Aida camp is close to an Israeli military base, close to the Rachel's Tomb Shrine and the Bethlehem Checkpoint. And the wall that Israel built is built right next to the camp. So the area where the children used to play between the olive trees is now on the Jerusalem side of the wall. And this wall is definitely not built on the Green Line, on the Armistice Line, the official border between Israel and the West Bank, because if that would be the case, it'll be 200 meters from my home in Beit Safafa, and we would be living on the Bethlehem side of the wall. So the wall was built as close as possible on the camp, leaving the Palestinians behind it and taking the agricultural lands to the state of Israel. That means that there is hardly any space for the children to play. The streets in the camp are very narrow. And protests against this wall were met with a lot of violence from the Israeli soldiers. And tear gas is shot very regularly at the people in the camp. It is said that Aida camp is the most exposed to tear gas in the world. As a result of the use of very aggressive tear gas, many Palestinians suffered injuries, were heavily affected by the lack of oxygen, or even died. And the number of women delivering babies with health issues is very high in Aida camp, especially the number of children with cerebral palsy. This is a permanent movement disorder that's caused by abnormal development or damage of parts of the brain. And these brain parts control the movements. They control balance and posture. Only last year, there were seven babies born and registered with cerebral palsy. Having a handicap in the camp is very hard. First of all, because it's common in the society to hide children with disabilities and there are no facilities and no adapted streets to move, for example, with a wheelchair or to be the least independent. In 2010, a number of women who had children with disabilities started together looking for how to support each other. And it started as simple as they were collecting money to be able to buy together bulk nappies from a factory in Hebron that produced B-quality nappies so they could save some money. And this initiative developed into the Mothers Club and then into Noor Women Empowerment Group to support the work that they wanted to do for their families and for their disabled children. They came up with a number of activities so they could be self-sustainable and they started organizing cooking classes, homestays for foreigners. They made a booklet with Palestinian recipes and they also teach how to make embroidery. One of the earliest founders is Islam. She's the mother of six children. The oldest one was born with cerebral palsy. And I talked to her daughter, Rua, who is running the Noor Rehabilitation Center. <music> I just arrived to Noor Rehabilitation Center. It's part of Noor Empowerment Group here in the refugee camp Aida. And I'm going to speak to Rua about the center and the work of the center. But I'm just peeking a little bit around here. Just after the reception, there is a room 
that is used for spending time with the children. There are some books and some toys for the kids. There is a sign that says speech therapy. This is the place where speech therapy is done. And then we continue and then there is another room. I'm going to follow Rua because she's the one who knows her way. There's basically only three small rooms that they are trying to use as well as they can. There is one room that is used for music therapy. And there is also a lot of storage here because they don't have enough space. And then there is a place where they can have a treatment, physiotherapy, and other therapies. And then there is a miss. She's sitting with three children with autism. And they are playing in the classroom. Marhaba, kif halak? Shu ismak? Shu ismak. Ana ismi Crystal. 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 O inta? Ana. Bishab. Shu bitzawu? Ana alab. Shu tilab? Ma ish? Adol, شو هذا اللون؟ تعرف شو هذا اللون؟ أزرق. أيوة أزرق. شاطر. وهاي؟ زحري. مع زحري؟ وهذا؟ هذا أحضر. أحضر. والله شاطر. شكرا. يلا العبوا. باي باي guys. باي باي. So there is so much good intention, but they really, really need a bigger space so that they can use it much more effectively. I'm here with Rua, and she's made some time in her busy schedule to talk to us about the work that Noor is doing. But before we talk about that, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. My name is Rua. I'm 22 years old. I'm working here at North Society for People with Disability with rehabilitation work, you know, relationship and things like that to improve our work and to get our work well known to people. Did you study something related or you just have the experience from working here? Actually, I got the experience from my brother. I have a disabled brother. He has severe palsy and now he's growing up. So, you know, I got the experience from him, but actually I studied architecture engineering. So it has nothing related to this work. That's what I see a lot here. People, they study something and then there is no much work in that field. But also this is very important what you are doing now. And I'm sure that it can give you another type of satisfaction. We are here in Aida refugee camp in Bethlehem. And I think it's also important for people to understand where we are. Can you just give us a little bit of information about why are Palestinians in a refugee camp and what is special about Aida refugee camp? People since 1948, since the catastrophe, they escaped from the villages because of the war. And they were worried about their families and their children. So they came here to this place. And by the way, this place is called Aida for two reasons. The first one, because this land goes to a Christian woman called Aida. And the second reason is Aida means returning back. So that was our big aim of returning back to our villages and our lives before the catastrophe. Do you know where your family is originally from? Yes, we came from a village called Beit Natif. It's between Hebron and Jerusalem. Yeah, even it's still there, it's not a settlement yet, but we're not allowed to go there or even to visit it, to have a look at it, nothing. And can you sketch a little bit how the life is inside the camp? What does it look like here and how is it to live in a refugee camp? Because I think a lot of people abroad, when they hear a refugee camp, they think you're living in tents. But since you are here since 1948 and we're talking probably third, fourth generation, I don't think you're in tents. Well, uh, that's what people think usually. But no, we're not living in tents. But after the catastrophe in five years, we were trying to work hard, trying to get some money because we realized in a point that we want to get back to our villages and our homes in a week or in a month, as they say it for us. It was a big lie. And people died in small tents in winter time, even in summertime. So we had an idea and we started thinking about it and working for building a room and trying to survive. Also, UNRWA started this work with us. They built one room for each family, but we're talking about our families. So one family means over than 12 persons in the same room. 
and the room is around 16 square meters. So could you imagine? Yeah, but the life in the camp here, I love the solidarity here, but it's too crowded, there's no privacy, and the streets, the infrastructure that you are having here is the worst in the world. And there is no enough electricity, no enough water, because we can't control of our water, everything coming from the settlements. And the life here also, we are living in Area C, which means we are not controlling our lives. We are living also close to the wall, 300 checkpoint. So because of that, sometimes a lot of Jewish soldiers coming here and throwing gas, knocking your door, it's your child. So it's not safe at all. And that's the life in Eindekam. It is a big challenge to stay here. I was just driving up my way through the camp and I realized that there are only a few roads where you can actually get with your car. And then you have all those little narrow alleyways and a lot of water tanks on the roofs of the houses because people have to store water for the times that the water through the pipes is closed and you don't get any water. So the situation is definitely difficult, but I'm always so surprised by the resilience of Palestinian people and projects like the one where we are here now. Before we talk about this project, we are now in the month of Ramadan. This is the ninth month of the Hijri calendar. This is what we learned last week in the podcast. Can you explain for yourself what does this month mean to you and how the Ramadan is experienced here in the camp? Ramadan is that much love for me because it's giving you patience, giving you love, solidarity, and asking about your neighbors. So at least you stay in your home and you make sure that your neighbors are not going to sleep hungry. And that is the most important thing. You pray you go to the mosque, you help each other, that's right. And that's what we do in Ramadan. But the most important thing is your feeling of giving things to people. Because when you have money or when you have something, you will start keeping this money or this thing that you have for you. So the aim of giving this thing that you have for people is giving you that much of value. So it's that much of important feeling and support and patient because in your daily life you just eat some people don't and that's how you get the idea for preparing food boxes or cooked food so it's giving you ideas for helping others maybe some people ashamed of saying yes i need money or i need food or i need something all of us trying to help each other even if your friend for instance say i need nothing but just give it you know this month just for these things, for these moments, for this solidarity. And that's what we do. Do you feel that during this last year of COVID that the situation of families in the camp deteriorated a lot? Is there a big difference between today and a year ago? It's difficult, you know. Before we were working with people like tourists around and we'll have income, income for the society here, for the community and everybody. But because of COVID, we start giving people patient of, yes, we'll support you. We'll give you, we will, we will. But always just saying it and have no idea of proving it to people. Why? Because there is nothing to do. There is nothing in your hand. And they're asking for money, for instance. Or they're asking for medicine. And you reach to a point, you can't even help yourself. It's so what about helping people? And you don't need to give promises that's not going to happen. So it's that hard. And you start just saying for people, okay, we'll see, we will see like next month, maybe next month. And we reach here to 2021, the second year. Inshallah, it will go because people really had a lot of hard times, especially the ones who work daily. Like you work daily and you get paid daily. So at the end of the month, you're not going to get a good budget like the normal people. No, at uh, the end of the month, you need to calculate the money that you reached daily or these days. And you're having no work, so it means no money, no support for your family. There's nothing to do. Let's talk a little bit about your work here in the organization, because this is a place where you are trying to support others and to give relief to families here in the camp. What is Noor? I remember when I read it first time, maybe, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago, and it said Noor and then W-E-G. And for us in Dutch, that reads as Weg, and Weg in Dutch means road. So I thought it's the road of Noor, until I realized that it means 
Women Empowerment Group. So what is Noor Women Empowerment Group? When did it start? What does it do? Noor means light, first of all. So as you say, this road and the road, it's kind of flight. So in different languages, you will get the same direction. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So Noor Women's Empowerment Group. A group of women, we can say 35 women from Ida Camp, mothers of disabled children, collect together and they try to do something for their children. Because they realize that if you're not going to support your child, no one is going to support you. Even, you know, in their same family, like if we talk about fathers, fathers always good, but compared to mothers, no. Mothers always the ones who feel about the family, about the children, what they need, what they have, and that's it. So uh, in the beginning, the idea started from two women, mothers of disabled children, were brave enough to talk to people, to find something to help themselves. So we start thinking about having cooking classes or something that all of us can do. Mothers of disabled children, of course. And we realized that all of them married, but not all of them well educated. And we got the idea of doing Palestinian cooking classes for foreigners in Bethlehem. And because Bethlehem always having people like pilgrims, and we start asking people about cooking classes and the idea like come to our kitchen and try our cooking classes and we start talking to people on the Facebook and everybody. Since that time till 2015, we start our cooking classes and things start to be bigger and bigger. In the beginning, we had just five people. But after five years, we're having in one kitchen over 50 packs. Now we have two places. These two places, one of them we can host 50 person and the second one we can host from 70 to 100. So it's that huge. At the same time, we do ready food. For instance, if you have wedding or if you have something like a meeting and if someone have allergy or something, we're trying to create a special dish for him. And that's the idea of giving newer the light for people's lives, not just for disabled children. From that time till now, we start the school here, Noor Society for People with Disability, because the money that we reached since 2010 till 2015, we were giving a percentage, like 20% for the people who work with us and for the cleaning, for the materials and everything. And the rest of it, 80% goes to the school here. So we're saving the money for five years and we open this place. And here, this place, it's for free. It's a charity helping disabled children in Ida Camp, Plaza Camp, and even people in Bejala and Hebron coming here and asking for our services. And we're always trying to help people. For instance, in physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, mental health program, osteopathy and music therapy and autism class, of course, because autism class now we are having 14 child, which is a lot because in the same class, we can't host, of course, 14. So always three, three, three to control them and same people that having the same diagnosis. And that's what we are looking for, because after six months, always we do another test for them to check their development, because we want to see where we reached. So from the last month till now, what we did for these people. And usually autism class, we're talking about sensory people. It's not like us, their thoughts, their imagination, which is good. They're smart, they're so smart, and they are lovely. I was just listening to a podcast from somebody who is autistic, but she's extremely smart. She's very emotional. She can feel other people. She just explained that she has just other sensory needs and that sometimes she doesn't fit in the general way of society. But if these children get special attention, they can very well function. Can you tell me a little bit about how people here in Palestine in general and in, maybe in the camp in particular, how they look at people with disabilities? If we are talking about a few years ago, we will see hard things for people with disability. It's kind of not respecting them or even looking at them in a way like, yes, okay, you need my help, you need something. I mean, don't look at him because he's disabled or at his physical disability or at his mind. Deal with him the way that you deal with your sister or with your brother because he's just a human. As he gives you respect, you want the same from you. So that's the idea of meeting each other here. But in Palestine, the situation, we can say everywhere, 
Of course, it's a percentage between villages, cities, if you are well-educated or not, because education always giving that development. We had some problems because people with disability always come here and say they don't respect me or they feel like I'm useless or they just need to carry me and I need a ramp or I need someone to pick me up from my home to the street, the ones who use the wheelchair. So it's that challenging thing that they have in their lives. And some people, they just gave up. They stay at home and they say, I can't go there because, for instance, my brother or people around me not helping me or not picking me up. So how come I will go to the street or even facing people? And they've been shy from saying to people, yes, I'm a disabled child. Why? Because they look at you. They look at your wheelchair. They're trying to give you money or something, helping him doesn't mean he needs money or he needs something. He just needs your respect. That's all. That's all what he needs. And that's what we're trying to save our people here. Because of that, we have a mental health program with psychologists always visiting people in the camp because we do home visits also. So uh, different kind of rehabilitation for the ones who can't come here till we encourage them to come. Because by ignoring them and saying they don't want to come, we'll get different type of problems here. Like from this year to the next year, we'll have more people having the same problem. So no, we are trying to solve the problem from the beginning till we reach the next year having a good result. Do you have an example of a story where you saw a child really changing and maybe blossoming after starting to come here, do you feel that there's a change in behavior or in attitude of the children and or of the parents? Yes, of course. We have a lot of successful stories. One of them, Adham, he is 24 years old. He has severe palsy. So his physical body not working well with his hands and with his legs, but his mind, like his brain is working 100%. So that was the point. We encourage him to study. And now he's studying in Open University. He's studying psychologist. Yes. So we said for him, look at him. You're smart enough. You can try it. You'll have people helping you, like your teachers, people around you. And that's how we start. He got the idea from us and we were inspiring him always and pushing him. So after five years, because he started coming here, I think 2015. And we were giving him physiotherapy and occupational therapy sessions. And while these sessions we were talking to him, even our psychologists were talking to him. And that was the idea of meeting someone and giving the light to his life. So after that, he said, yes, I will go to Taujihi. Taujihi, it's the final exam at high school. So he got a good result. And after that, I talked to people and he said, I want to go to university. And we said to him, yes, we'll encourage you. We will try even your fees to cover them from us, from people. We'll see. We'll find a way. At least just go. And now he's studying in his third year. So he's always coming here and trying to be a teacher at us. He's saying, you need to do these things and rules. And uh, so we just said, oh, Hajan, <laughs> just four years ago, you were just, you know, now you're giving us directions. <laughs> It's an amazing story. Somebody who came here to find help, who will later on be the person who can actually offer help. It's a great story. Can you tell us a little bit about the Ramadan Food Bank? That's also an initiative by Noor, right? We did this project called Ramadan Food Bank because we want to help people around us, our neighbors. And we got the same idea last year. So last year, under the name of Be My Neighbor. So Be My Neighbor is the same thing that we do today because we started the concept last year and this year we're continuing with this because we had a kitchen downstairs. It's called Norweg, your Women's Empowerment Group, and we we're thinking about preparing cooked food. But when we ask people, we had always meeting with people and asking them about our work and what we do, what we can develop and all these things. It's kind of feedback. So they said for us, we prefer to give us food books instead of cooked food. Because while giving me this quantity, uh, not going to be enough for my family. While I have six children and others have ten, and maybe uh, some people have two. So it's not equal. And because of that, we start the idea of buying food boxes. 
We start saying for people, this is a project. We spread it around with our friends. And we said, we want to do for this Ramadan furnishing 300 food boxes. So these food boxes contain the basic things for the house. So include beans, include sugar, you know, the basic things for any house. Also with milk, because we don't want to forget the babies. Especially in these times, because of Corona time. So people always having that special need. They always been asking for food boxes, for helping. Maybe they've been shy from getting food from others or even asking you for money. But we know that they need it because their neighbors talking about them. They said, for instance, they go to the street, they try to ask people about things, how much is it, but they don't buy. So it's that hard for families. And after COVID-19, it's a really hard life. And because of that, we start collecting money. We just ask them to donate if they can. And we give them the link of our project at Palestinian Food Bank, or let's say Ramadan Food Bank. So the idea now is to give food during Ramadan. So from the beginning of Ramadan till the end of it. But to reach more people and more money, we will continue giving people food boxes even after Ramadan. That's why we just call it Food Bank, because we want to give people maybe during the week, maybe during the year, and we just gave them food boxes yesterday, by the way. And this is one of them, you know, this box. Oh. Let me check what's in the box. There's one box here, a cardboard box. Can I open it? Yes. On the side. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Oh, there is halawa and lentils, sugar, oil. This is coffee, tea, tea. This is milk, milk maybe for the baby, spaghetti, frika, which is very healthy, tomato sauce, rice, lots of basics that are really important for people. A box like this would cost maybe what, like at least 50, 60 shekels? This one, 150. Oh, wow. Yes, but before the last Ramadan, we were giving people food boxes contains a lot of things more than this one you know we're having a budget now because of small donations but yesterday we already gave people 60 food books so 60 in 150 for each one so it's that amount of money for us always we're trying to reach more people and even people start asking and saying you give my neighbor but you didn't give me so why i mean we have a list of people and you need to wait for your turn how many people are there in Ida camp and how do you select who is the poorest ones? Well, we have here 6,000 and a half. Our priority here as Noor, people with disability and their parents and their families. So once we finish, people with disability will go to the poorest one. How? Because people know each other. We just know them and we have a group of mothers, like 35 mothers. So these mothers, all of them go to the camp, visit people inside their houses. While drinking coffee, they just ask them about their situations and you'll find everything. And that's our way of touching people. We don't want asking you about your situation because in this way, no one going to say I'm poor or I need money or I need something. But we're trying to reach them in a friendly way, like, I'm your neighbor, I want to sit with you, I want to see your situation, we are friends, and this way. Yeah. And that's how we reach people. We have database, so this database contain both people with special needs, like people with disability and their families, and the second one is the needy people in Ida camp, the poor one. And always checking them if they need something, if they get to another development, like their children, if they want to go to university, how we can cover their fees with people like friends of us want to give donations. And that's how we work. What is your dream for Noor, for the Rehabilitation Center or for the Women Empowerment Program? Do you have a vision? In 2010, we start with a vision of building a school for disabled children. Now we're having the place, we're having the services, but we're not having that building. This place here around 70 square meters. And we're already having sensory room, but we don't know where to put it. And we're having materials and machines very important for people and for disabled children especially, but we don't know where to put it. And we're looking for a place and people for helping us in a place or even maybe as a donation or even as something that we can rent or we can buy for years maybe. 
but we find nothing. Always when we ask people about this building, it's that kind of good building. And for me, because of my study, so I can charge if it's good enough for people with disability or not. And that's what I'm doing right now, even interior design, if it's helpful for a disabled child, a disabled adult or not. So basically, once you had building and or funding for a building, you would start a project where basically all the children in the camp who are suffering with the disabilities from not having access to a normal school would have the opportunity to be in a school. Should that go through the Ministry of Education? Is that something that you are already connecting to or is that a step further? From the beginning, we talked to the ministry and people working there, but they said you're a charity, so you need to work by your own. And that was the hardest part for us. Because once you were working with cooking classes and suddenly you start with the rehabilitation school and you have no idea about the thing that is going to work with donations and people work because you can't ask people to pay. They can't pay. So we were just looking for donations and from a project to another. We had projects at Global Giving website explaining everything. But it's still not enough for us. We're looking for a good fundraising that really help us, like projects helping NOR as NOR, as a big association helping people in Ida Camp. Now we have 300 people with disability and we're trying to help all of them, but not in the services. In the services, we can cover 45. 45 people always coming here and it's that crowded place. We're trying always to organize it to uh, say for people, yes, your schedule is here. And every six months, we change the schedule with different people. It goes to the development that we reach. But it's still that hard. Why? Because people need help. And we know that we go home visits for rehabilitation work, but still people need to be covered and their services. And no one asking about disabled. Like, let's say, yes, maybe they ask about poor people or even about food as people do in Ida camp, but they're not asking about disabled and what they need. Maybe they need a surgery. Maybe they need a wheelchair, like assistant devices. Maybe they need to get education and no one allow them to go. So we just go with them and we help them in these steps to reach the point that they want to do something in their lives. But at the end of everything, we need a building and we need a very good fundraising. We're looking for help from Banksy because it's that much important for us. Just so that people know who is Banksy, he's the famous graffiti artist that painted several of his graffitis here on the wall. And then he also started the Banksy Hotel, which is just close to the big checkpoint in Bethlehem and also not far from here. So you're saying that if Banksy would hear about this project and if somebody had the chance to reach out to Mr. Banksy, whoever he is, because nobody knows who this artist really is, that you'd like to sit with him and talk with him, right? Yes, sure. It's a pleasure for all of us. Everybody looking for a word to meet him. So what about meeting him for human service? It's that huge and it's that important. Everybody looking for a word to see him, but we want to see him because of these services, because of people with disability and children with disability. So it's that need and it's that human thing. So Mr. Banksy and anybody with contacts to him, please let him hear this podcast episode and somehow reach out to the NUR program so that you can hear how important it is to start some support for this place. And if anybody is listening to the podcast and they are inspired to do a donation to support you in your work with disabilities, but also maybe for the food bank project, is there a way to make donations from abroad? Yes, we have a project at Global Giving. It's a website. And what you need to do is to go to our website, New Society for People with Disability. So you just open it and you will see the label for support. You go there and you will have everything like our projects at Global Giving and projects for the center here. And you can help for Ramadan or even for programs for the people like autism class, a physiotherapy class and for different classes. That's great. I will post the link in the show notes of the podcast so people can just go there, click on the link and see what you're doing and then make a donation. That would be super, super appreciated. My final question. Do you have a special Ramadan message to the world? Our message always on Ramadan is solidarity because 
Ramadan being built for solidarity and for humanity. In this world, we realize that everybody starts thinking about money, about increasing more and more. But Ramadan is the month of, as we said, Shahr al-Khair. So, inshallah, it will be this month of good things, good memories, and good help, especially for poor people, for needed people, for children, for everybody. We're trying to help as much as we can in our society for people with disability, and we want people also to do this thing. Maybe we can't reach everybody, but everybody can help everybody. There's something that we always say, maybe you can't help everyone, but everyone can help someone. And that's it. That's the point of Ramadan. Thank you so much for taking this time to explain us a little bit about the work. I know you're very busy and there's lots of people and children waiting for you. I wish you a blessed Ramadan. Thank you and nice meeting you. Thank you for listening to this episode. I hope that you realize how hard it is to live under the circumstances that people live in in this camp. When I was packing up my recording equipment, a woman came into the center. Her son has ADHD, and that was very obvious from the moment he came in. He was very hyperactive, and his mom looked very exhausted. Rua told me that many mothers are struggling, especially this year during the COVID pandemic, because the children are at home. Most families do not have any devices for homeschooling, they don't have money. There's nothing to release their burden and tension. So this woman, she received her food box from Rua. And as she walked down the street, I just realized how hard life can be and how blessed and privileged I am. During the month of Ramadan, it is common for Muslims to show acts of solidarity, but you don't have to be a Muslim to support others. So if you feel inspired, please click the link in the show notes of the podcast and make a donation. And if you know a fund or an organization that can support Noor Empowerment Group, please be in touch. And if you happen to know Banksy, then please get him to listen to this podcast. That's it for today. You can, of course, support the podcast by sharing it, leaving a review on social media or on Apple Podcasts or on Podchaser, and by supporting on the Ko-fi page. Sign up for the email list. All the links are in the show notes. And listen again next week. Ramadan Karim. For the Dutch organization Pax for Peace, I recently produced the Pax Palestine podcast trilogy. The first three episodes will be available from Tuesday the 30th of March. The 30th of March is Palestinian Land Day, a day on which Palestinians emphasize their rights and the consequences of the Israeli occupation of their lands. Pax Palestine podcast is available on most podcast players. In Pax Palestine podcast, I talk to the local Palestinian partners of Pax that work for justice and peace in Palestine. Search for Pax Palestine podcast in your podcast player or go to paxpalestinepodcast.buzzsprout.com. Double Z.